Gómez. We are going to be watching all eight of the Harry Potter movies today. It's 19 hours long, so buckle in, get ready. Um, it's 9 a.m., so I'll be done pretty late tonight, but I'm eager to start watching. Um, we're not going to be like reviewing them or like really reacting to them, but I'll stop in between every couple scenes and we'll talk about it, show you guys my favorite scenes. It's, it's going to be a party, but without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, first one, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosopher's Stone. Yay! Okay, I've now pulled out my Hogwarts blanket and I have my wand and we are about to go into Diagon Alley and so excited, okay. If you guys have ever been to Universal Orlando and saw their Diagon Alley, it looks exactly like this. I'm gonna insert some pictures or like videos that I have from it but literally, it's like you walk through and like, you know, the Order of the Phoenix house is there, Grimwald Place. There's all the like parts on London. There's King's Cross Station. Like, you have no clue what's coming. Then you walk through the like brick wall and it, it's literally exactly what Hagrid did. Like with, when he did this with his um, umbrella and you just go straight in and it looks exactly like this. And I'm still amazed every single time I go there how they were able to create this. It's crazy. One more point I want to make and then we can get back to watching. I think the reason this was so like popular and did so well right away was because we were introduced to the world the same time that Harry was. So while you're reading the book or even watching the movie, you have questions, but so does Harry. So it's not like Harry already knows the answers. Like as he's learning, you're learning too. And I think that's one of the reasons why it was so successful because you feel like you're so a part of it. It's not like someone's just telling you, you know, all the magic. Like, you're learning as Harry learns, which I think is so cool. Look how little the twins were. Aww. They are so cute and little, and it's crazy because I watch these movies often, but I don't really ever watch the first one. I don't know why, I just don't. But they're so cute and little, and Ron's little facial expressions. Like, oh, so little and cute. Um, I might cry when I finally see Draco Malfoy and his little, my name's Malfoy, Draco Malfoy. <laughs> yeah, Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. <laughs> like, oh. Scenes like this where they're literally fighting a giant and a troll, I think about that they are literally 11 years old. Like literally a year ago they were 10. And five years ago from 10, they were five. They're practically five years old. And they're doing all this. I just, I always think that's crazy. And I've always said that. I'm like, how they're so young doing such like adult things. Like what was I doing at 11 years old? What was I doing? I don't know. I definitely wasn't fighting trolls though or anything like that in the monk world. This is the Quidditch action that we deserve to see in literally every single movie because every book talks about it for multiple chapters and it's barely in any movie except for this one. This movie is really sticking to the source material really well, which a lot of the other movies kind of like deter from the source material, but this one's doing a really good job sticking to it. There's only a couple scenes they missed out. The trio was in the library looking at books about Nicholas Flamel, as they should, and I noticed something kind of unpleasant. Look at the library. I don't mean to be a stickler or anything, but I've literally just never noticed that the library in this movie is not the same library they use in the rest of the movies. And the library scenes are always my favorite because I feel like they're so like, they're just beautiful and they're well lit and the colors are always so pretty. Also, I'm a TV and film major if you guys don't know, so I'm really into like behind the scenes. I'm into color grading and angles and you know i noticed all those type of things i watched the behind the scenes and they said that they couldn't do as much like cool shots and transitions and whatnot because the actors were so young and they needed like more takes or like multiple shots so it was very choppy and i noticed that so i think this is why i'm not going to give this movie as big of a score as i'm going to give the other ones oh, oh, no. <laughs> what is it he's going to sacrifice himself no you can't <laughs> That was cringe. That was cringe. Plot twist! 
great movie it is so cute i think it's the perfect opening like i was talking about in the beginning how it kind of introduces us to the world harry to the world great movie but what i noticed it's not very cinematic like it's just a movie there's no long draws to the beautiful scenery or cool color grading or cool angles like it's just a movie um and i think that's the difference between the first two movies and then the rest of them like i think prisoner of azkaban that is the third one beautiful that's when that really shifts to a more cinematic type series so i'm excited for that i'm gonna give this movie a 7 out of 10 because the acting was a little bit cringe which i'm not gonna give them too many points off because of that because they're little kids the cgi was not the best which again it was 2001 i was literally born in 2001 i think i was born right before this movie came out so i don't want to fault them too much on that because i don't know what the technology was like but then they're going to get points off because it wasn't that cinematic and it was just a movie but it's of course the first one in the series so you know you can't give it too many bad points it's definitely not in the top five but i don't want to give it that it's my least favorite either because it's the opening we're gonna oh i feel bad doing this though i have to do it because i know it's to come and i know that the end movies i'm gonna have to put high on the list so we're gonna rate this seven out of ten and this is going to be my least favorite movie of all of them it's so hard to say but it just wasn't cinematic and i'm a big 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 fan of the cinematic moments which we will talk about all of that when they come oh i'm so excited to get to um the half-blood prince that movie cinematic masterpiece number one and two were directed by the same person christopher columbus so i'm assuming two is going to be the same type of vibes the same choppy scenes which you know of course they had to do what they had to do eee! okay harry potter and the chamber of secrets movie number two let's go daniel radcliffe's acting is already 10 times better than the last movie but also i meant to say this in my little movie review thing i think the first movie was spot on with how the characters acted like you know in the books harry is definitely more sassy hermione is like the annoying unno very annoying friend like i thought i even thought she was annoying and then ron is like the selfless best friend um and I just thought they did them really well in the first movie. But as we go on, they definitely kind of lose the essence of that. But I think the first movie did a really good job of sticking to the source material, like I said earlier. Oh my gosh, it's my favorite house elf, Dobby! <laughs> I feel like the beginning of this one is not that memorable. Like, I just don't, I didn't, I don't know. Like, I was watching it and I was like, yeah, good, cute. Like, it sets up the story, but it's not like the main point of it. So, you know, I don't have too much to say yet. So I think this whole car sequence is pretty cool, but it's actually kind of long. I feel like I've been watching it for like five minutes and they are still in this damn car. Like, please just get them to Hogwarts. Guys, this movie is not bad, but I am very bored right now. Like I keep saying, I just like the movies that are more, that are like cinematic masterpieces. And the first and the second one just aren't that. They don't cut it. They're kind of just still establishing the, the movie. I feel like they don't actually get beautiful and amazing until the next one. I just mean for my personal liking and because I know what's coming next, the first two movies just aren't exciting to me. Um, that's all I want to say. I'm not crapping on it too hard. I just, the first two ones aren't, aren't the best. I absolutely love this shot. Like this... This is a cinematic masterpiece. This is what I'm talking about. That that was amazing. The movie's almost over, and I can't wait to go see Tom Riddle because the actor who plays Tom Riddle in this movie, I think he looks so cute. But uh, Voldemort, no. But Tom Riddle, yes. <laughs> there is the Tom Riddle I'm talking about. Doesn't he look so cute? <laughs> I know, it's insane because he's evil and turns into Voldemort. But like, you can't tell me that is not a cute boy. Okay, Harry has made it into the Chamber of Secrets. You know me. I am watching Tom Riddle very closely. Major plot twist. Anyway, um, but also, if I was Ginny, I would probably write in that journal too. Especially if I'm able to see this boy. Because he's very cute. And I would want to talk to him as well. But this is definitely a badass scene on Harry's end. So I'm excited to watch it and kind of excited that it's almost over because we get to go on to Prisoner of Azkaban, which is no doubt when the whole franchise takes a turn. I made a heart, if you guys couldn't tell. 
go Harry, go Harry, ooh, ooh, go Harry, ooh. Except I don't like that they killed this guy because then you never get to see him again. Literally the other other Voldemorts are like a baby Voldemort and then like a teenage Voldemort, but not the fine teenage Voldemort. It's like the 13 year old Voldemort who's evil. Okay, we have finished Chamber of Secrets. I'm going to give it a seven out of 10. He's gonna get the same score for Sorcerer's Stone because they're just the same movie in my mind. Like I think the first one really sets and establishes the world. And then the second one, there was good elements to it, but it wasn't a killer movie for me. So I'm gonna give it a seven. Acting 10 times better. CGI was a bit better too, but I just, I keep harping on it having to be like a cinematic masterpiece but that's just how i look at the rest of the harry potter films so seeing the first two not be to that standard in my head is just weird this one is directed by alfonso cuaron amazing movie i love this one um amazing movie this really sets the tone for the rest of the franchise i absolutely love this opening and i've honestly never noticed that before which kind of makes me sad but i love how we had the warner brothers logo and we go into the room Perfect, chef's kiss. For the rest of the time, you guys are just gonna see me praising all these movies, and it's because I genuinely love them. I just, Chamber of Secrets didn't give it to me, but ah, here we go. Harry is an absolute badass in this movie. I love it so much. Ah, guys, I'm sorry, but huge stan. So one of my most favorite scenes in the entire, well, of this movie is coming up. So I'm gonna flip this camera around, show you, explain it. It's it's a beautiful scene. Okay, so we have this wide shot of the area, an establishing shot. We know where there are, right? Everyone's acting. You see Hermione moving. The twins are over here. Camera's still moving. There has been no cut so far. Then we change to this conversation, right? Move, move, move. Everyone's still acting. Still no cuts. Move, 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 move. Then we go this way. Oop, we get a look of the the little poster as they're talking about it. Then we take a little more steps. Now the poster's not really in the shot, but we still see it. Everyone's still acting in the back. Guys, they have still not cut. This is one whole entire scene with no cuts, no edits. I, I absolutely love that. I love that the poster is like the middle part of the conversation and that's exactly what they're talking about. Straight acting, straight recording, no cut, no edits. I absolutely love that. I think it makes the scene feel so fluid and feel like you're a part of it. It's, it's awesome. And I think Prisoner of Azkaban is the only movie in the franchise that does it. And that's definitely because the director, that's like his style. But amazing, I find that so cool. This scene right here where they're on um, the Hogwarts Express with the Dementors, perfectly reenacted on the Hogwarts Express and Universal. The Dementors come to it and it like comes and it goes into your cart and it's like, you don't actually see it, but it's like a video, you know? And then it goes by your cart and Harry's like, expecto patronum, and it goes away and it's all, oh, it's cool. I don't know. I love Harry Potter. I love the Universal parks. I think, they did an amazing job taking the movie and making it into like a real place you can actually go visit. And I can't wait to go back. Like, you cannot tell me this is not cinematic and beautiful and outdoes, outdoes the other two movies. Like we actually see the grounds. We actually are experiencing it. Like, I just, I love it. Also, they had the best glow up in this movie. And yes, I'm one of those people on Harry Potter TikTok and half the comments are always like, you guys are so weird, like they're minors, blah, blah, blah. But like, it's a movie, it is fiction, it's not real. And I think it is so funny that like they, they really got lucky picking little kids that were gonna grow up to be like beautiful and handsome, especially Tom Felton. Um, but wow, I just love it, masterpiece. The sexual tension in this scene, why is he biting his lip and looking him up and down? Demento, demento. <laughs> this scene is pretty cool too, especially with the soundtrack in the back. Amazing. If I attended Hogwarts and was in my Defense Against the Dark Arts class and this was my lesson, I think my Bogart would probably be a shark, but I don't know how that would work because it's not like they could fill the classroom with water and I feel like a shark out of water isn't as scary because in my head I know they're gonna die soon. So we are nearing the end of Prisoner of Azkaban and oh, I, 
just I can't say enough good things about the rest of these films and I love that this one has such a clear misdirect like when we first see Sirius Black it's like oh my god like he's literally about to kill them and then Lupin runs up and you're like yes he's gonna save them and then he disarms Harry and you're like what now what what now and then snape comes and you're like finally someone's gonna save them but we also know that snape's kind of evil so like maybe he's not it's major plot twist okay subtle detail you guys see the clock in the back and then hermione just turned back time and if you guys like noticed throughout the movie i didn't really point this out but the clock has such 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 a big point and like interest point in the movie and almost like Every transition to a scene is like that one where you go through the clock or you're looking up the clock or the clock's moving. It's, I just love that they're kind of fore foreshadowing that the clock is going to play a big part in the movie. Okay, we have finished Prisoner of Azkaban. Now we are moving on to Goblet of Fire. But before that, as we've been doing, rating. I was going to do 9 out of 10. But that's a little high. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I really, really, really admire how the director had the scenes being so fluid and not so many cuts in it. I really, really enjoyed that as you guys saw because I talked about it all the time. I also really appreciated how much they focused on the grounds of Hogwarts rather than just like the insides of it. If Alfonso didn't do that, the rest of the movies wouldn't have done it either because it wouldn't have really paid a homage to anything. But I really love this one. I think this is like the turning point in the series. Um, it's not dark yet, but like we know it's coming. For my list, I'm gonna put Prisoner of Azkaban 4 out of 8. Like number 4 on the list. And I'm not putting it too high because I know what's to come. And I, I just enjoy the other movies a little bit more. But let's get into Goblet of Fire. Alright, here we go. We are watching this one on Prime Movie. So the sun is starting to set, which means we are getting into night vibes, which is perfect because this movie is definitely dark. So my problem, my problem, I'm trying to say my problem with Goblet of Fire is that it does not follow the source material at all. And again, a behind the scenes clip that I saw, the director said he didn't want to read the book because it was too long. And I was like, you can't do that if you're remaking a movie from a book. But it's actually like quite different and they leave out like four characters, which kind of bugs me because it all leads into the plot. But if this movie wasn't based on a book, you know, like if I didn't have the book to go off of and it was just the movie alone, amazing, great, love it, a beautiful movie. But the the fact that it doesn't follow the source material um, as well as the others kind of bugs me a little bit, especially because like it wouldn't be made without the book. So like why, why stray from it so hard? But I love these type of clips where we're seeing the grounds and you can kind of just see like the makeup of the buildings. One question though, so you know how Dumbledore has the pensive and Harry Potter finds it, falls into it, whatever. What is stopping anyone else from diving into it and finding out like all of Dumbledore's thoughts? That is just a question. If someone knows the answer, comment down below because I'm actually very curious. Also, very bold statement I'm about to make, but we are, we were 100% gypped of that Quidditch World Cup experience. Do you know how badly I wanted to see the Vila spitting fire at little leprechauns? Like, that that would have been amazing. My favorite Draco Malfoy scene is coming up in like a minute. I'm so excited. Please look at this. You cannot tell me he does not look fine as hell. If I could pause time when Tom Felton was this age, I would probably give up everything, fly to California and wait outside his house or apartment, wherever he lives until he comes out and dates me. Because, I mean, I would date him now, but this Tom Felton, <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I'm sorry. I just, they get really cute in these older movies. I love it. This is an example of when I say the older movies are literally a cinematic masterpiece. We have the Durmstrang ship in the back. I like that the water's kind of like foreshadowing that they're gonna have a task in the water. Also seeing the Great Hall just in like a chill location, not being used for a gathering or something that's like, you know, a big deal. I think that is so unique and it makes it. Next issue, I'm watching this scene. Hagrid and Madame Maxime are walking in a corridor and he's like telling her that he's a giant. But in the books, it was actually like a big scene. Like it was 
humongous and it was a big problem so i don't know for then i just kind of like glide over it so effortlessly and not even allude to the fact that something bad did come out of that is cuckoo 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 big cuckoo another example of a cinematic masterpiece look at this how beautiful i i love this i love it like magic magic and major 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 props to Daniel radcliffe they said that he spent like 48 hours or something like that or probably, actually probably more than that but practicing underwater to film this scene and i just think that is it's so cool like this whole process is awesome if youtube doesn't want to take off for me and i do go into the career that i'll have a degree in i actually am super eager to work on movies it's gonna be so fun I love that Harry always comes in to like make sure that people aren't doing something that's like immoral even though they have every right to, but I love that. <laughs> Cedric. Ah, <laughs> oh, look at this scene. I love it with the Triwizard Cup in the back. Oh, that's chef's kiss. I love this. We've made it into the graveyard. Voldemort is about to return. This scene gives me chills on the little baby ugly body's like and he's like and like comes back I'll, I'll show you guys this is the ugly baby body coming back to life and this is what i was saying when he like feels his head all weirdly and he like comes back oh my god gives me chills this scene is actually low-key funny to me like voldemort and his voice it just it's kind of funny i know it's not supposed to be funny but it is like do you what what was that Voldemort, oh my god, I'm sorry Harry, you have to go through this, but Voldemort is just, he's so dramatic, I think it's so funny. Goblet of Fire, I'm going to give it a, I want to give it like an 8 out of 10, but I can't because of how much it strays from the source material, and I feel like that is so vital when recreating a book to a movie, because there would be no movie without the book, so to like blatantly just disrespect so much of it, I feel like not cool. So I'm going to give... Goblet of Fire, a 7 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, 7 out of 10. We're just going to leave it. But on my list of all of them, I'm going to put it at number 3. So I do like the movie. I like it on its own when I don't even think about the book. It is amazing, great. I think there's so many really great shots in it. And I like that all three of the events are like done so well. Although I do wish we could have seen how the other competitors did for the first challenge. But it's all good it's okay all right watch now we're watching this on hulu i know i'm about to spoil but i love that in this movie we hop right into the action i like that it's right away and we get into the wizarding world literally like five minutes in which i think is very smart because i hate when there's long drawn out intros Harry being taken by the order from the Dursleys is so iconic. I love this. What? Look at this. I wish my camera was picking it up better. That looks so pretty. Like I was saying how Goblet of Fire and Azkaban, it's kind of like the turn in the franchise where you see like something's coming, but like it hasn't come yet. Goblet of Fire, it came. Voldemort's here. But then this one, I think that... The order picking him up kind of establishes that like Harry's not really a child anymore. He is, but he's getting into big boy business. And I think having him flying with them opposed to him flying with like his Quidditch team at Hogwarts is just showing the difference, showing how, how old he's getting and how like important his role is going to be in this movie. I think I love the movies that come like later in the franchise because they just like wrap it up so perfectly and I feel like you get little tiny hints in every single movie what's coming next and I always find it so like mind-boggling like okay I'm gonna be honest with you guys I only just started liking Harry Potter and wanting to be a fan of it like in the past like three months probably so when it was coming out I was like 10 and I just didn't really like I don't know 10 year old mind I didn't care but I always find it so cool that the movies were coming out simultaneously with the books so they were making these movies not knowing what was in the next book and there's like little hints in each movie of what's coming next and i think that is just so cool that jk rowling had it all planned out that she was able to just i don't know it's brilliant it's a masterpiece but very clearly we don't like jk rowling in any other sense of life but she's brilliant and i can't like you can't take that away from her regardless what her political views are or whatever her views are 
You can't take that away, but brilliant. I. That's all I have to say. It's brilliant. You guys know what I'm gonna say. I'm not even gonna say it because you already know. But look at this scene. One of my favorite scenes is approaching. I love this scene so much, and I'll explain why I love it. But let me show you it. Oh my god, I'm getting chills thinking about it. Ugh, I love it. So I've done extensive research on these films and I read like a, it was like an overview of this film, like a strict critique critique. And it basically was explaining how Voldemort is wearing Draco's suit. Like, we've never seen Voldemort in a suit before, but that black suit is what Draco wears at the beginning of Goblet of Fire in the Quidditch World Cup and just what he's wearing in general. And I think that's so like, it's Harry making the connection between Voldemort and Draco kind of working together, but also like he doesn't know how to pair them together. I just, brilliant, amazing. Whoever came up with that, thought to put Voldemort in Draco's suit, I think they're amazing. They're smart and great and I love them. I also love this scene with Harry doing that little head bob thing. I love how it focuses on like the media trying to cover something up because they have a different agenda because that's like real life and a lot of the stuff in the wizarding world obviously doesn't actually happen but that is a topic that we do actually deal with which I think is cool to like incorporate and also I love that it is establishing that Harry is going through something and Harry is not like his classmates anymore. He doesn't have time to sit and learn spells at Hogwarts. He's literally trying to save the world because Lord Voldemort is trying to kill him and no one believes him. I love, 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 love the sequence of Dumbledore's army learning dark arts. I think it is so iconic. This, this movie's iconic. I've said that like four times already. This again is another example of how they are directly establishing the contrast now between the students. Like the ones that are going to fight are going to fight. Like there is a battle coming. <laughs> I love it. I love that the camera is like slightly tilting, but it's not like so obvious, but you guys see it. It's, it's like doing this. I love the fight scene between Voldemort and Dumbledore, but I always thought this was so unique. Maybe not unique, but we could say like interesting. Every time Voldemort fights Harry, he never brings out any of these cool powers. Like the fact that he can take fire and make like a whole snake out of it is insanely cool. And he never uses any of it on Harry. And again, I read this thing that was saying that Voldemort does not think he's equal with Dumbledore. He's like scared of Dumbledore, so he thinks he has to bring it all out. But Harry, he sees as equal, so he thinks he could just do whatever. Like just, I don't know. Okay, we have finished Order of the Phoenix and overall thoughts, overall score. I'm gonna give it a eight out of 10. I was gonna give it a nine out of 10, but for my own personal reasons, it's only gonna get an eight. Um, I think out of the last, like the final four of them, Order of the Phoenix is definitely my least favorite one, but it is a great movie. I think there are great shots in it, like all the times that I showed you. I think there's really good concepts, especially with Voldemort wearing Draco's suit. I cannot get over that. I think that is just so brilliant. As you guys saw, I literally harped on it for like 10 minutes, but we're gonna put her at five. I think she deserves fifth place, but, I have some dinner now, so we're gonna eat, we're gonna watch Half-Blood Prince. I think I'm gonna talk less because I just want to enjoy the movie. I really want to enjoy it. And I think you guys have a really great overview of why I love the movie so much and what I like in movies, what I don't like in movies. So I'm gonna try to talk less. Okay, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince start. I love this movie so much. I'm really sad Draco has to carry out such a terrible action, but... I love the way the lighting is set up in this scene. Like we're getting the lights from the fire and like the small lights in the background, but it's still lit really well. A lot of people complain that the last couple mo movies that were directed by David Yates are way too dark and like you can't see anything. And I love how the transitions always go into the books or the newspapers and kind of gives you a hint of what you missed if you didn't read the book. I feel like I'm about to scream with how much I love the coloring in this movie. Like I was saying, I can definitely agree and understand about people are saying how it's like way too dark, but I think this movie specifically did a really great job of having the grays and then the different house colors like still popping. I just, I love it. 
I really love it and I'm really jealous that I didn't create this. <laughs> I know, that might sound crazy, but that's literally how I feel sometimes. I'm like, why didn't I come up with this? Why didn't I do this first? But it's amazing, it's such an inspiration for like future projects I might do. One of the best transitions is coming in like 30 seconds. Probably my favorite, favorite, favorite transition of the entire thing, entire thing. This. I love this. We see Ron and Lavender, right? It's like all the different emotions that everyone's feeling. They're all kissing, it's like, oh yeah. Then we keep scanning the building. We have Malfoy like contemplating his life, thinking about what he's gonna do. Then we keep going. I just, this is what I'm talking about. This is why it's so great. That was the best transition change. I, best thing I've ever seen. I'm sorry if I'm being dramatic right now, but I feel like you can agree and everyone can appreciate how great that was. I can't. This might make you all cry, but I have to show this scene because cinematic masterpiece, all I could say. That, the slow motion Dumbledore fall into the courtyard. Beautiful, amazing, I love it. Okay, so we finished Half Blood Prince, and before we even get into the reaction, the review, the rating, any of that, I saw this TikTok and it was one of those ones that's like, what's Gibby thinking about? And then it was like the fact that um, Sirius never got to know that Snape called himself the Half-Blood blood Prince. And I just thought that was hilarious because truth, Sirius would have roasted him so badly for calling himself that. But next, on to the rating. I get this movie, honestly, I'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10. I think the storyline is perfect. I think why I love it so much though is all the cool transitions. Um, I love when they're like walking in the corridors, like having their own conversation and then it like pans to the left or the right and you see Draco in the corner like contemplating his life because he's about to do something that is so evil and immoral and it's just, it's, it's a really powerful movie and I love that about it. Masterpiece, amazing, beautiful. Um, in the order of the movies, obviously, Number one, I love this. This is gonna be my top movie of the entire franchise. And I say this honestly, 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 because the shots, they are so pretty. The color grading, so pretty. I just, I can watch that movie every single day probably and just admire how beautiful all the scenes are. But without further ado, Deathly Hallows, part one, then part two, then we're done. It's getting late. It's like 10 30 but it's okay we're gonna do it i never stay up this late though okay harry potter and the deathly hallows part one hermione using the obliviate charm on her parents just hits me differently i think this is so sad like <laughs> this movie this movie hits different for sure for sure especially the beginning when everyone's leaving and it's just like, you know, you know it's about to get real, for real. I love this. And seeing this compared to the first movie, The Troll, and then the CGI in this one, it's just, it's actually out of this world. I, wow. Can't even lie, I'm getting tired. I've been at this for a very long time now. Not complaining, but I am tired. And I forgot how drawn out part one is. Like very drawn out and I'm ready for part two while I've been watching I am just thinking about the first movie which she started at nine o'clock this morning and just how different it is how much they grow like Hermione I was literally laughing at her acting Ron was making the most cute faces and Harry was just being a little sassy little boy and I just I can't believe they grew to this it's crazy something else that I just noticed while I was talking the camera is very 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 shaky and it's not like shaky like a running scene like it's just like it's moving with the scene and I kind of feel like it's giving off the vibe of like they're searching for horcruxes this is obviously a very stressful time no one's really even having it together and the camera doesn't have it together either it makes it look so rigid and just put together but like it needs some help and that's exactly what the trio needs right now which i love i can't even lie to you guys i'm so tired right now but this movie's actually almost over and i normally don't watch it when i'm like this tired and watching it tired is kind of forcing me to think it's boring 
but also I normally watch it straight through. I'll watch one into two. I never just watch one alone. And I think if I had watched this when it first came out, when it was in theaters, I think I would have been so pissed if this is all I saw and then I had to wait like eight months to see the next movie. I would have been pissed, like really mad. So at least that's not the case and we can go straight into two and two will definitely wake me up. But this one is almost over and we will give my final thoughts, critiques, and all that in a minute. I'm obsessed with this story. I'm obsessed with the graphics totally forgot this was even in this movie like my mind just totally went over it but i love this and i love that it signifies a different character we can get into that so i don't think this theory is canon but i do see it a lot and read about it and i kind of like it so we'll share it the theory is pretty much that voldemort embodies like the, the brother who took the elder wand because he wants immortality he wants to be the most powerful wizard whatever makes sense right then they say that Snape embodies the brother of the Resurrection Stone because all his motives are literally just to like avenge Lily and to be with her because he loves her so much. So that would make a lot of sense. And then it was saying Harry embodies the brother with the invisibility cloak because he's just a good person. He just wants to be safe, whatever. And then it says at the end that he um, greets death like an old friend and that is exactly what Harry does. Well, I'm actually spoiling this. I'm sure you've seen the movie if you're watching this, but then Harry, you know, when he dies, he greets Dumbledore, death, like an old friend. And I think it's really, it's really profound to think of it that way. And I think it's really cool that you can kind of tie all the characters back to really the overarching part of this entire thing. I love that. We have now arrived in Malfoy Manor, AKA, which leads to probably the saddest part of this entire movie. Dobby just died. I hate this. Okay, we finished part one. Like I was saying, I never realized how boring this movie was and I think it's because I never just watch it as its own. I watch it into part two, so it kind of just feels like one movie for me. But I was watching a video breakdown from Movie Flame where he was saying, it's really hard to not pair them together, you know, to look at it as a separate film because JK Rowling wrote all the stories with the hero's journey. Like that was her like story theme. And although the entire series has its own hero's journey, each book has its own one too. So Deathly Hallows has its own journey and it's 12 steps. And I think he was saying part one stops at part six and then the next six steps are in part two. But having the break in between just kind of leaves part one at like a weird middle point. Like, you know, the story isn't finished and there's still so much more to learn, but like we've already gotten a lot at the same time and it's kind of like the slower parts of the hero's journey and the fun parts come in the end so if it was one movie it would obviously be amazing but splitting it into two is kind of hard so overall on my list of my order of favorites i'm gonna put this at number six i know it's really far down but it's okay it's it is what it is if it was one movie it would probably be number one but we can't look at it like that and then overall rating, I'm gonna give it, oh, I hate to do this. No, I'm not gonna do that. I was gonna say a seven out of 10, but that's kind of harsh. I'm gonna give it an eight out of 10. I think the shots are really pretty. The coloring's really nice. I think that it's very evident that like it's the end of the series and like, let's kick it into high gear. Um, it's also cool the actors have grown up so much. Like I was saying, it was kind of nostalgic to watch these all day. And it's like early in the morning, they're little kids. And then by the time I go to sleep, they're old. Um, so yeah, we're gonna give it, 8 out of 10, it's going to be number 6 on my list, but now we're going to part 2 and then we're done and um, I hope I don't fall asleep, I'm just going to say that. Alright, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part 2. I'm giving this movie's opening scene a 10 out of 10. Um, I didn't show you guys the dark part in the real real opening, but I really loved how that set up the vibe to, you know, like warn us foreshadow what's happening and then we get back right into where we left off in part one and then the best and the probably like thing that shows they pay such close attention to detail so in universal in the diagon alley section they have a ride and it's called escape from gringotts and it is literally it's exactly like that you go all the way through gringotts bank it is so cool i will put in some pictures um and then you get on the actual ride and you have 3d glasses and you're literally going through the mines and their screens and 
Voldemort and Bellatrix are like fighting you and they're like, oh, it is, it's an amazing ride. I love that ride. It's getting real and I'm getting emotional. The end is very much near and I'm very sad. I'm sorry guys, but I have to jump right over the Hermione and Ron kiss. I just, I've seen it 30 times before. So we're gonna hop over it. What I'm really waiting for, I love when they reveal Snape's true true thing. I love that part. Why all this is very nice and it's like hard on Snape. Also, Snape would not have done this if Neville was the chosen one and I think we need to unpack this because if it was not Lily's son, literally Snape would have continued being a Death Eater. He does not care that it's a child and Voldemort is being a bad person. He cares because of her. That's literally the only reason. And I'm sorry, Snape, but like she doesn't want you. She's here for the right reasons, and for that, Snape is still an X through him. This part is actually so sad to me because like Harry could only die and come back if he was ready to die. You know what I mean? Like the resurrection stone only shows itself when it feels he's ready. And to think he literally is in his head like I'm ready to die. That's crazy. Crazy. Harry is not selfish because he's literally going to die for this. Avada I can't. I love this. Of course it's happening inside her head, Harry. Why should that mean that it's not real? That is my favorite line from the entire series, franchise, movie, all of that. Mark my words now. I'm getting it tattooed. I don't know how or in what form, but I will have that meeting tattooed on me one day. I love this shot with the art. I cannot believe we are so close to the end. Go, Harry! Go, go! go. Oh, I love this. This again, cinematic masterpiece. I honestly don't care to see how Voldemort dies because that man should have died like a regular person. He shouldn't have disappeared and evaporated like he did in the movie. He literally should have dropped dead. Because he's a normal person who's just evil. This makes me so emo. Guys, we are done. We have, oh my god, platform nine and three quarters. I feel like my heart is just crying. I love this. This is, I'm so happy I did this. And you guys, just like that, we are done. We have watched all eight Harry Potter movies in one day. It is actually insane. Um, my ratings for the last movie, you get a 10 out of 10. Deathly Hallows, part two. You did your thing, boo. I am so proud of you. I love it. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm tired right now. I feel kind of delusional. Oh, number two on my list, definitely. I think all the action is in this. I love it. Definitely getting a Dumbledore tattoo, like I told you guys. Um, I also love the I open up the clothes, so maybe I'll get that tattooed too. I don't know. I feel like in a year from now, you guys are just gonna come back and I'm gonna have like 30 Harry Potter tattoos. So we'll see. But we have completed this 19 hours. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you more than you will ever know. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Well, I'll see you in a couple hours because. <laughs> We still have to do another vlog for tomorrow. So, okay. I'll see you guys in the morning. Goodbye, and thank you for watching, and I love Harry Potter. Okay, bye.